Hello, loyal followers and casual viewers. Welcome to another edition of the Story Behind the Stories. This week we are talking about the January 7th, 2022 edition of the Nipua Banner and Press. Uh, my name is Kira Patterson. I will be your host for today. Um, joining me today is my co-worker, Casper Werhan, um, archivist and reporter for the Nipua Banner and Press. Thanks for being here, Casper. Good to be here. And uh, yeah, we're sort of switching things up on mm -hmm. the viewers today. Usually yep. I'm over here hosting, but you're hosting today. I, yeah, in your regular chair. So. Exactly. I like to be on this side because I'm a little bit hard of hearing on that side. So then I can hear the person I'm talking to, which is usually a good thing with a talk show. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we improvised a little bit and figured we'd switch things up for the new year. So um, I guess we'll get started. We have our front page story this week. Um, is actual news, which is surprising because we weren't 100% sure if we'd have actual news in this week's paper because it's always a little bit slow at the beginning of the year. Not a lot of stuff happens kind of over the Christmas break and stuff. Um, not a lot of ads usually come in either. So we usually have a fairly small paper, 16 pages this week, which is a little bit less than our average of 20. Um, and But yeah, something did happen just before uh, we started putting the paper together and that was the announcement of the school back to school plans for the province which is not back to school immediately it's back to virtual school um, so they announced on tuesday january 4th that there was going to be a week of remote learning for most students in grades kindergarten to grade 12. Um, and um, it was mainly because as probably most of you know, there has been quite a large increase in cases due to the new variant that has kind of all of a sudden crept up in, in Manitoba and in Canada. And a lot of other provinces have also been doing the shift to remote learning to go back to school from Christmas. Um, so it's kind of to give some time for the government and the data analysts <laughs> and the um, doctors and stuff to figure out what exactly this Omicron variant means for schools and how they will be able to function with this variant in the midst of the communities. Um, and it also gives some time for uh, the teachers and staff to kind of get things organized for kids before they get back into classrooms because they are going to be shifting to orange level. They were currently, um, until now, they were at yellow. Um, so orange means it's a little bit more just restricted. There's a little bit more um, strictness, I suppose, with keeping distance and making sure that um, nobody is too close together and some other things that I forget off the top of my head because it's been a while since they've been in orange, but um, there is that shift. So there will need to be a little bit of time for the, the teachers and staff to get kind of used to that. Um, so is this something that you were kind of expecting, Casper? Um, well, I'll be honest, uh, I hadn't been keeping too close of an eye on things. Uh, uh, I've been doing a lot of archive stuff, trying to mm. still keep ahead and whatnot. <laughs> um, and then just, yeah, I, I haven't been <laughs> keeping <laughs> too close of an eye on all this, uh, just coming back from the break and whatnot uh, for the new year. Um, but I also can't say that it was unexpected, <laughs> just because, you know, hearing some numbers here and there mm -hmm. uh, in the office after getting back is just, you know, the things are happening. Yeah. So, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> in, in this case. Um, so I, I'm curious as to like what the people out there think of it that are impacted by this because mm -hmm. obviously, well, I'm not in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have kids. Exactly. I'm too young for that. <laughs> um, but there is exception as well. I don't remember if you said that already or not for uh, people mm -hmm. who are in critical services, uh, right. essential services. Yeah. Um, like health care and whatnot. So I, I believe it was that their kids will still be able to be in the school, yep. but anyone else will be remote learning. Yep. Um, and I think so far, the feeling seems to be that Omicron is likely not as severe mm -hmm. as the other variants, but obviously that's still being studied. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, want to make sure that the due diligence is happening yes, there so exactly. uh under understandable decision mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i know like we don't 
have any teachers working here because we're a newspaper um, but like my mom she works in a school and she kind of she didn't have any super strong opinions about either way but we have heard anecdotal stories about people that um, are strongly against it and some people that are strongly for it some parents that are like I don't want to send my kids back to school because of all the spreading but then there's other people that are like oh if I don't send my kid back to school he's gonna struggle with school and he's gonna um, have mental health issues <laughs> because they can't see their friends and they just don't get to socialize with people and, and there's there's obviously concerns on either side of it definitely valid points on both sides of it for sure um, same with teachers there's some teachers that say I don't really feel comfortable being in a classroom full of children um, when there's this super uh, transmissible variant going around it's it doesn't feel right but then there's others that are like we just need to have the kids in school so there's really good points on either side um, in my opinion I don't have a really strong opinion on which one it should be um, but I just think that people need to remember that there are reasons for either side like if you don't want to send your kid back to school but they are going back to school it's because they think that that is what's best for your kid and vice versa so I just think that we kind of I know a lot of people get really bent out of shape about things like this and it's really hard to remember both sides of the story when you're really set on one side so it's just try to keep an open mind and remember that they are even if they might be wrong they might be right they might be wrong um, they are trying their best to do what's best for the kids um, the government and the divisions and all of that so I think that's just kind of the message that we should try to remember um under all of this yeah yeah i i think you covered that really well <laughs> honestly i don't think i have anything else to add to yeah. that so, um, yeah that summed it up very nicely all right so let's um, move on like I said we don't have a ton of stuff in the paper this week so we're, we might kind of chit chat a little bit about th different things for a little longer than we sometimes do um, but our next story is on page two and it's about the uh, snow clearing that happened in Nipo or didn't happen in Nipo for a little bit before it actually did happen. Um, I remember when we came back to work on Monday this week, we had last week off. So everybody came back to work on Monday and one of the first topics of conversation was, why are there still piles of snow in the middle of the street? <laughs> and um, to be honest, I thought, okay, maybe they're on holidays or maybe it was just because of the freezing cold and whatnot because I can't blame people for not wanting to go out in the freezing cold or for their vehicles not starting in the freezing cold or for wanting to have a Christmas break. I can't blame people for that because I wanted to have a Christmas break too. Um, but uh, yeah, so Owen was um, kind of on the case and was like, I'm going to get to the bottom of this as to why exactly it took a full week to get this streets completely cleared up. Um, so there is a little bit in here about that. Um, there were obviously some factors. Uh, the extreme cold was one reason that they didn't get out as quickly as they wanted to. Um, there are several other things that they talked about. So there, definitely give that a look. But I'm going to throw to Casper really quickly because Casper lives in town and gets their streets paved on a regular, paved, uh, <laughs> cleared on a regular basis. <laughs> It'd be nice if they were paved on a regular basis too. We have, we have some lingering potholes <laughs> throughout town. I think people know a few regulars. Yeah. At least a few <laughs> I'd be surprised if they didn't um but yeah I I stayed inside a lot over the break there uh just because it's so cold mm -hmm. um but I knew that clearing was happening uh I think before the break or like the first day of the break mm -hmm. something like that uh early on anyway um so when I finally started up my car to go somewhere, which I'm pretty sure was work for the first time that we were back, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was very confused. I was like, these piles are still here? Was there just another snow clearing <laughs> I didn't know about because I was in my warm, cozy hole of a home? <laughs> no, it was the same piles um, <laughs> from like, eight days ago mm -hmm. <laughs> um and they hadn't been cleared yet uh and we were discussing it in the office like figuring it out and she's like isn't it supposed to snow again tonight <laughs> yeah 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They'll have their work cut out for them. But no, I think like the very next day it was cleared bright and early in mm-hmm. the morning. So it was mm-hmm. all kind of just like, I wasn't expecting that to be honest, but mm-hmm. no complaints, no. honestly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it does, they talked about the hydraulics being one of the things that is easily affected by the extreme cold, which we definitely did have extreme cold um, last week. And so there there were some different factors to it. And I, I can totally understand. And I can understand why it's frustrating for some people um, when you're trying to get across the street and there's just a pile of snow there. So you're like, do I go to the next block? Do I go to the next turn? Like how, how exactly do I navigate this place? But they do a pretty good job of clearing all the intersections and that type of thing so that people can like get across or um, go to the crosswalks and that kind of a thing. Yeah. At first they weren't like they were just going straight through Mm. uh, except for the highway. Um, and I think a couple other streets, uh, they did have the intersections all clear, but I found a lot of them weren't like that. Like mm-hmm. the ones right by my house, uh, oh, they okay. weren't like that. Um, they just went like straight through. So I actually <laughs> saw some tire tracks going through cause they were just like, I want to get over here. <laughs> and thankfully it was a low enough dip. So nice. they were able to, but, um, uh, I think like the next day they had that cleared up okay. so the intersections mm-hmm. were all clear at that point and then yeah later on they were yeah. completely gone yes. so yeah not too bad yeah and i luckily i missed the bulk of it because i didn't come into town really until i had to go to work so <laughs> i didn't have to be driving around and navigating around at all except for like one or two days they had gotten it done by tuesday i think it was i think so so i only had to navigate around that for like one day ish so that's good um but yeah no and i i also want to say thank you to the snow clearers um that's p baker backhoe and rob smith and son um they they do a phenomenal job and sometimes they get the short end of the stick because people are always grumbly in winter and it's always snowy and that kind of thing it's like oh why isn't the streets cleared but they can't be out there the instant the snow falls so i do want to thank them for their efforts and for being able to get the streets cleared when they do um, because it would suck if it was just piles of snow on the road all winter. (laughs) Um, Next, we have a wonderful story. I've been doing a lot of talking, but now it's Casper's turn to do some talking (laughs) because I only quickly read this story and Casper actually wrote the story, so they know a lot more. Um, Casper, tell us about this Gladstone pilot. Yeah, uh, so this was an interesting story that I got to do. It was actually the pilot himself that contacted us being like, hey, is this like of any interest (laughs) to you? It's just like that. Actually, yeah, we like to do this kind of thing. Um, But it's Blaine Bjarnerson who contacted me from Gladstone, uh, where he's originally from. Currently in the I might be pronouncing it wrong, but uh, the Maldives, I think. Yeah. and he's he's a pilot and he's been a pilot for for quite some time now and really that sort of path he got set on it at a really young age uh his father uh and his uncle were both farmers and pilots in the gladstone area um so he grew up with that and he actually had his first flight uh with with help of course (laughs) uh when he was 10 years old and he just he got hooked like it's just like yeah i i want to do this um but it wasn't until he was 18 that he was like okay yeah i want to i want to fly like commercially uh and do this as a job and that resulted from uh just going off the top of my head here a talk with a cousin i believe Mm -hmm. uh that really just convinced him to just go right for it uh, so he got his first job, I have the date highlighted here, uh, in 1976, uh, and that was as a dock hand at first, and then became a flying instructor in 1977, and then afterwards, uh, took a job on a C-185, I admit that doesn't mean a whole lot to me, I don't know planes. <laughs> Uh, on floats in May of 1978 and just since then hooked on being a bush pilot uh, and has also flown a lot as a seaplane pilot as well. 
and it's just you know just kept going is still flying at the age of 63 down in the Maldives there um but he's he's done a lot of things like he listed a couple examples there and I have some in the article but pretty much just like anything you can think of he said like I've he's done it um in terms of flying there and yeah he's been all over like northern Canada the United States uh Virgin Islands Maldives as I've said before Rhode Island Croatia and I should have asked more about this one because I was like what what kind of stuff did you do there uh but he's been in Saudi Arabia as both a bush pilot and a seaplane pilot as well um and he's written a book on his experiences uh from over the years and it's like 230 pages this book and he said just yeah originally I didn't know if I was going to like have enough to to make a book but eventually it's just I couldn't stop <laughs> I didn't know when to stop <laughs> um so I wonder if he if he got everything in there that he wanted mm -hmm. to because it's like 45 46 years I think he said uh of experience that he's had so lots to tell for, for sure, sure. Yeah. uh i haven't gotten to the book yet because ken's been reading it i think he's like halfway through it or something he's been reading it over the break mm. there so i'm very curious about it to read through the stories uh ken said that's it's, it's been really interesting cool. so far so yeah yeah that would be really interesting um i I'm super jealous of how much he's been able to travel with that kind of job. That's really cool. And the fact that he's in the Maldives right now when we're sitting here complaining about cold and snow. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the photo he sent me of uh, himself there on the page, uh, page nine, by the way. Uh, take a good look at that. Um, of him with this uh, Maldivian cabin attendant there. And just looking at it makes me feel warm because you got like the sea and the the blue sky there and you can tell the sun is really shining mm -hmm. so it's just like thanks for that <laughs> i'm cold in the office but not anymore because yeah. i feel like i can feel that sunshine on oh, me nice. <laughs> a nice relief yeah exactly we're always Stuck shivering here back with there. all the snow <laughs> bah uh, humbug right <laughs> who needs christmas if you have to deal with snow <laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of what he's been up to. Cool. Um, he had started writing it. Uh, you'll see the exact dates in there, but he'd started writing it after he was laid off for a little bit from uh, one of his jobs. Uh, so he had a lot of time to mm -hmm. sort of kind of do whatever he wanted there. And it's just like, yeah, I want to write this book. Um, but it's now back out flying and He's, he's enjoying his last couple of years down there. I guess he'll have to have a sequel since he's back out and he'll have more adventures. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Write another book, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for, for telling us a little bit about that. And thank you for getting that story because I was not on anything. I didn't have a single byline in this paper. <laughs> so I'm glad we have some in-house stories. Um, Speaking of non-in-house stories, kind of, um, this is one that I actually really enjoy every year, even though we don't actually write the story or get the information. Um, this is one that's submitted by MPI at the end slash beginning of every year. Um, and it's their top five auto insurance frauds. And I always have fun reading these because the creativity of some people um, on how to they think they can trick MPI. It always, it's a little bit entertaining. Um, it's a little bit frustrating that people think they can get away with this stuff, but when they don't get away with it, then it's entertaining. <laughs> it makes out for some really just interesting, maybe odd stories. Yeah. Like the very first one, it's just, I could not, I it would not compute. Um, <laughs> but number one was, phony kidnapping mm. <laughs> like how did you think to to be like oh yes i got kidnapped by these people and they went for a joyride in my car and it was actually no you were you were doing that yourself you went for the joyride and then just said you got kidnapped mm -hmm. and taken along for one yeah 
Yeah. I, yeah, just the line of thinking is kind of interesting, mm -hmm. I, I guess mean, you could say. Yeah, exactly. All of these instances, they obviously knew they were doing something wrong. The phony kidnapping was she was out for a joyride with friends, drunk, driving around. So obviously she knew that she was going to get in big trouble if she admitted that that's where all of the damage came from to her vehicle. So um, it, uh, they have, they kind of have to get creative to try and avoid facing the consequences of these things um but yeah like it, it's just kind of interesting to see the mindset of some people they're like oh i was street racing but i'm gonna say that i was uh just fell asleep at the wheel and was only going five kilometers over the speed limit when i was actually going 100 kilometers over the speed limit right yeah um, so it's it's really i always kind of find it funny but it's also kind of like a shake your head face palm kind of moment like what the frick were these people thinking <laughs> why would they ever do something like that and then why would they think that this wild story is going to get them out of it um one of them was like oh i i swear i saw a dog and i had to swerve out of the way when in fact it was somebody that didn't have a license that was just driving like a maniac and drove into somebody's yard so it's just um, definitely give it a read. It's on page seven. Um, it's one of my favorite things that comes in like over the, the new year. It's like, oh, top this of 2021, top that of 2021. This is one of my favorite things that comes in that we get to read um, just because of the creativity and the stupidity of <laughs> some people. Um, so yeah, page seven, like I said, give that one a read. Um, we do have other stuff in here, definitely, but um, it's it's some in-house, some like submitted, some like press releases that we kind of rewrote. So that one was one of my highlights. And then obviously the Gladstone pilot story is one of the highlights I think of this week's paper too. Um, but yeah, if, uh, if you're looking to go even deeper, how about we talk about some looking back? Sure. Uh, yeah, I admit uh, we kind of have the same ebb and flow uh in in the archives there when it gets to either the start of year or end of the year things sort of get a little bit sparse uh but we have a couple a couple fun little things in there uh of course every year for quite some time now uh the papers have been keeping track of the first new year's babies in town uh which i believe we just got this year's mm -hmm. in today so I'm pretty sure that'll appear next week, yep. so keep an eye out for that. Uh, very cute baby. We had a look at it all together. Um, but yeah, so we have a few first babies from the archives there. We have one from 1952. Uh, that was for Mr. and Mrs. Roy Smith of Riding Mountain. Uh, we have another one in 1972. 2002 and I believe there's another one but I can't see it off the top of my head here uh, and aside from that there's also uh, a militia survival training course uh, here in Nipois in 1962 so some people might be interested in reading that short little snippet hmm. uh, and we have just a nice photo of this little kid enjoying some skating with uh, with some help there it's a bit of a struggle sort of <laughs> getting into the first little bits of skating uh when you're just just that small uh so that's a cute photo uh from the archives there in 2002. um i think those are i think those are the highlights you know um but there is i believe a bunch more interesting stuff in next week's that okay. I'm excited to share with everyone. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, because of the fact that you're looking through old papers and our papers are what's always kind of slow, that it's like, okay, this year's paper is kind of slow. 10 years ago, the paper, first paper of the year was kind of slow. 20 years ago, the first paper of the year was kind of, you can kind of see the pattern. It's, it's <laughs> always like, nobody really wants to do anything around Christmas and New Year's. So we're just going to have a little small paper that has not a lot. And if, if the New Year's baby happens to come before our first uh, edition gets published, then we'll get it in the first paper and that'll be our big news story. <laughs> so. And then, you know, sometimes things just really wild happen. <laughs> True. And it's like, oh, 
okay way to switch <laughs> didn't expect that but i mean hey <laughs> i'll take it i guess it happens it happens yeah. some things you can't predict and they just they just come out of nowhere so it's uh, it's always interesting to look back through um looking back i have to be honest i didn't get a chance to read through it this week because i wasn't at the office on the day that we went to print um so i didn't proofread any of the pages or anything like that which is when i usually read most of the stories um because i got snowed in so <laughs> it, yeah. it snowed a little bit uh, earlier this week and the fact that it blew so much was what it was. If, if it was just the snow, it wouldn't have been a big deal, but it blows and then it drifts. And on the country roads, it's not always great. So, and I have a small car. So I, I drove through a few drifts. I was like, yes, I made it, I made it, I'm gonna make it. And I got to one drift, I was like, I'm not gonna make it through that one. So I turned around and went home, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So when I, when I came into work today, it was the first time I'd actually seen the completed paper. I'd seen a few of the pages cause we were working on them before that, but uh, it was the first time I'd seen the completed paper. So that was one of the pages I didn't get to read, um, but it always is a good read. And I will make sure to take a quick closer look at it later today. Um, but yeah, there's there's some other stuff. We have our RCMP report. We have a sweet potato stew from Helen. Um, our classic columns that come in every week. Um, there's lots to read, even though we ourselves didn't write a ton of stories this week. Um, definitely pick it up. It's not a throwaway. It is worth taking a look at. Um, and even if it's just for the ads and stuff, because we do have advertisers that they pay to be seen, so we want you guys to see them. <laughs> yeah, and you never know, they could have some good deals exactly. coming up, like, or who knows, maybe an event or mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. So yeah. definitely take a close look at those, make sure you're not missing anything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and of course, uh, there is events throughout the year that uh, may unfortunately be getting postponed and mm -hmm. whatnot uh, one of which we do actually mention in our paper here uh, egg days mm -hmm. uh, is going to be getting po uh, postponed they don't have a date for that yet um so it, i i would assume probably getting put off until like next year but they don't have a confirmation mm -hmm. on that yet that's yeah. just my assumption yeah they they were hoping i think to reschedule it for um sooner than later i think they wanted to have one in this year yeah. but they don't have any confirmation on dates and they still have to talk to their um exhibitors and all that kind of thing so there's there's always a lot of different um aspects to look at when you're trying to reschedule stuff so yeah we don't have any confirmed dates for that but they are hoping to not have to cancel it for this year yeah and hopefully hopefully they don't have to mm -hmm. cancel it because i know last year they did have mm -hmm. to um and this is the second year that's being affected by the COVID-19 situation, yeah. which is which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully they're able to do something in yeah. some capacity. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I know last year they didn't do the actual egg days, but they did kind of a virtual online thing where they somehow they they made it like an online magazine and they made some other did some other stuff maybe had seminars and stuff i can't remember exactly how it worked but they tried to do a virtual thing last year and they said that they were very happy with how that turned out so if nothing else i'm sure they will try to do that again this year if they can pull it together um, but i guess we'll have to see and keep an eye out for any more updates from them for sure because yeah. i know a lot of people in the area um, look forward to egg days and there are even some exhibitors that are from the nipoi area eden area um, are rural surrounding communities and that kind of a thing that actually show their stuff there. So it's definitely uh, very relevant to this community. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, lots of other stuff you can find in there. Um, we are running a little bit short of time, so I don't want to keep you any longer uh, than I'm allowed to. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we uh, appreciate any story leads that you guys have. As we said, we are a little slow at this time of year. So if you have any suggestions, anything to uh, show or tell, give us a call. 204-476-3401. You could also send us an email. You could send to news at nipoabanner.com. That goes to Owen. Um, you could send to myself at pages at nipoabanner.com um, or Casper at newsroom at nipoapress.com, right? Yes, I believe so. Awesome. 
and um, let us know if there's anything going on or if you'd like to book an ad, you can call the same number, 3401, or email ads at nipawabanner.com. Um, we, we are a free paper, so we always rely on those advertising dollars to keep ourselves free and to pay the wonderful staff here that you can see. <laughs> so um, thank you again for, for giving us a, a watch and a listen and uh, hope to see you next time on the story behind the stories.